Since the mid-20th century, humanity has learned to manipulate the very building blocks of the universe. Nuclear power has allowed us to generate immense energy, create devastating weaponry, and make groundbreaking advancements in medical research. It's an incredible scientific achievement, and as it turns out, it can even be applied to transport. Nuclear submarines have cruised the ocean since the 1950s, and today, massive aircraft carriers are powered by atomic energy. So if nuclear power works on that scale, why not scale it down for something as commonplace as a car. You see, in the late 1950s, the largest car manufacturer in the United States dared to dream of what personal transportation might look like in the future. The design they came up with has since become a fascinating symbol of atomic age optimism. This is the story of the car of the future that was imagined 70 years ago, the Ford Nucleon. 1958 sits firmly in the heart of the atomic age. Since the first atom was split, a figurative atomic boom had swept across the United States as people explored how to harness this revolutionary technology. By the late 50s, atomic energy was reaching the American commercial market. Nuclear power promised clean, safe electricity so abundant it would be too cheap to meter. Residents of Pittsburgh had begun receiving electricity from the world's first full-scale nuclear power plant. Meanwhile, 450 kilometers northwest in Dearborn, Michigan, sat the headquarters of the Ford Motor Company. At Ford, someone saw the potential of nuclear energy and dared to ask, what if we could harness this power for our vehicles? That visionary was Ford designer Jim Powers. The concept he conjured was the Ford Nucleon, a nuclear fission-powered car with an actual uranium reactor in the trunk. It sounds like something straight out of the Fallout franchise, but in 1958, this was a genuine idea that Ford was seriously exploring. And, I mean, just look at it. It's a retro-futurist fever dream, a mashup of a Ford F-150 and the Jetsons flying car with a nuclear twist. So let's dive into some of its striking features, shall we? Now, the Nucleon boasted retractable bumpers to enhance its sleek aerodynamic design, paired with a set of antenna and optional tail fins. And honestly, without the fins, it's hard to tell which end of the car is the front. From one angle, it looks like a classic 50s lowrider hot rod with a futuristic edge, but only in reverse. Viewed head on, though, it gives off Poopmobile vibes. Cars aren't supposed to look like this, its proportions are spectacularly bizarre. But let's move beyond its wild appearance. How was the nuclear-powered car supposed to work? And what were its features? For starters, there would have been no harmful emissions because nuclear power is far cleaner than gasoline. In theory, a pint-sized reactor powered by uranium pellets would sit in the trunk, and when it came time to refuel, either the pellets or the entire reactor itself could simply be swapped out for a fresh one. And here's how it would function. The reactor would boil water into steam, which would then spin a turbine to generate electricity. That electricity would power the car and its electronics. The water would be cooled and recycled in a closed-loop system, allowing the nucleon to run for as long as its fissile material lasted. Radiators and air intakes scattered throughout the car would keep it from overheating. This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your online presence, whether you're starting fresh or scaling up. If you need a website that looks like a professional designer built it, but, you know, without the headache or the massive expense, Squarespace's design intelligence has you covered. Their AI-powered tools help craft a unique, polished site in minutes. And if you're selling anything, whether it's product, services, or even your expertise, Squarespace Payments makes it seamless. Accept credit cards, Apple Pay, Klarna, and more, all with just a few clicks. Want to offer appointments, coaching, or consultations? They're a Acuity scheduling tool lets clients book with you directly on your site. No back and forth emails needed, which makes everything so much easier. Which is what Squarespace does, they make everything easier. So, if you need a website that does it all, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash megaprojects to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or a domain using the code megaprojects. And now back to today's video. The interchangeable reactor was a key feature, offering owners the ability to customize their car's power source to suit their needs. Want a teeth-gnashing uranium B10 for speed and performance? No problem. Prefer a low-torque, high-mileage version for leisurely drives your grandmother might find a bit slow? Absolutely an option as well. And with no noisy gasoline or diesel engine under the hood, the Nucleon would have been remarkably quiet. The only sound you'd hear was the faint whir of the turbine, not unlike the hum of modern electric cars. So, there's a lot of conjecture about how the Nucleon was meant to operate, but what do we actually know about its specs? How big was it? How fast could it go? And what kind of fuel economy could you expect from a nuclear car? 
Well, according to Ford's press materials, the Nucleon was envisioned as a long vehicle, even by 1950 standards. It stretched 200 inches from nose to tail and measured 77.4 inches wide, while its roofline stood at just 41.4 inches high. Those are some goofy dimensions. The only modern car that measures up similarly in all three is the Maserati Gran Turismo. It doesn't seem too weird, that's a sleek, luxurious car, but just wait. All right, it's the wheelbase that takes the cake as the Nucleon's silliest dimension. Measuring a ridiculous 69.4 inches, it's smaller than the wheelbase of most smart cars, and smart cars are nearly half the length of the Nucleon. Now imagine that absurdly short wheelbase on a body the size of a Maserati Gran Turismo. The wheels are crammed so far back to support the reactor's weight that the passenger cabin juts out precariously, making the whole car look ridiculous. And yet for such a goofy looking vehicle, the Nucleon had some pretty enticing features. On paper, the nuclear reactor in the trunk would have provided one heck of a fuel economy. Ford's promotional material claimed that the car could travel an astonishing 8,000 kilometers before needing to be refueled. For the perspective, that's like driving from Paris to Islamabad on a single tank. No range anxiety here. And it wouldn't just be efficient, it'd be fast. A nuclear-powered car could theoretically churn out enormous amounts of energy, translating into serious horsepower. Speed wouldn't be limited by power output, but by the supporting systems, aerodynamics, radiator, efficiency, torque, and fuel conversion technology. If all of these components were optimized, a nuclear car could potentially outperform many modern vehicles 70 years ago. According to Ford, drivers would even have control over the engine's power output, customizing performance at the push of a button. So, given all of that, well, why aren't we cruising at 300 miles per hour across continents today, powered by mini reactors strapped to the backs of our cars? Well, the answer to that is it's complicated. For all the Nucleon's theoretical benefits, there are a lot of reasons why the concept never made it past the drawing board. The first reason the Ford Nucleon never went into production isn't quite what you might expect. You might assume the biggest hurdle would be the sheer impracticality of fitting a nuclear reactor into the back of the car, but that's not entirely true. In fact, the designers at Ford anticipated the miniaturization of nuclear reactor technology, a reasonable assumption given how technological advancements tend to shrink devices over time. Just look at computers in the 1960s compared to today's smartphones. Even in 2024, scientists are discussing micronuclear reactors as potential power sources for lunar bases, proving that the concept wasn't entirely outlandish in the late 1950s. But while it might have been possible to fit a reactor into the nucleon, the project couldn't escape the laws of physics. As Professor Dr. L. Dale Thomas, Deputy Director of the Propulsion Research Center at the University of Alabama, explained to The Drive, the core challenge wasn't accommodating the radioactive core itself, and we'll quote him here. The reactor core itself, including shielding, for a small nuclear reactor could indeed fit into the engine compartment of a personal vehicle, which would generate ample energy to power a personal vehicle. However, the difficulty arises from the energy conversion problem. The nuclear reactor will generate thermal energy, which needs to be converted to mechanical energy. The quote ends. So you see, in a car, an engine has one main job, converting thermal energy into horsepower and torque to make the car move. In a standard internal combustion engine, this happens in a single step. Exploding gasoline creates thermal energy, which is immediately converted to mechanical power. But in a reactor like the one envisioned for the Nucleon, the process would involve multiple steps. First, the uranium fuel pellets would generate thermal energy as they boiled water into steam. Then that steam would spin a turbine, converting thermal energy into mechanical energy. The turbine would generate electricity, another energy conversion, uh, which would finally be turned back into mechanical force to drive the wheels. With each stage of this process, some energy would be wasted, creating inefficiencies. As Dr. Thomas succinctly put it, quoting, energy conversions are just like currency exchanges at the airport. You always lose. Now, in theory, these efficiencies wouldn't stop the car from working. It would just run less efficiently. So why not slap on some radiators to handle the excess heat and zoom around at nuclear speeds? Well, there's a problem. While a full-scale nuclear power plant can handle energy inefficiencies with advanced turbines and heat recycling systems, a car simply isn't big enough to house that kind of equipment. 
In a regular car, a lot of wasted thermal energy escapes via the exhaust, which helps keep the engine cool. But the Nucleon would use a closed-loop system, recycling water into steam. Without an exhaust, that heat wouldn't leave the system naturally. To manage the heat, the Nucleon would require enormous radiators covering the vehicle. Ford optimistically predicted breakthroughs in energy conversion technology that would expel less heat, allowing for fewer and smaller radiators. That would result in a lighter car that's easier to drive. But even today, we are still chasing those advancements. With modern technology, the Nucleon would remain impractical. It'd be heavy, efficient, and it'd be dangerously hot. And that brings us to everyone's favorite topic, safety. Back in 1958, awareness of the dangers of radiation exposure was just beginning to grow. The Nucleon was designed with some safety features, such as positioning the passengers as far away from the reactor as possible and encasing the reactor in heavy radiation shielding, likely made of lead. But even with these precautions, radiation exposure wouldn't have been eliminated entirely. The shielding would also make the car absurdly heavy, meaning it would handle like a battleship on wheels. And then there's the issue of crashes. Imagine what would happen if you rear-ended another car with uranium in the trunk. Every fender bender would become a potential catastrophe with the possibility of a radiation leak. That's assuming you could even get the fuel to power the Nucleon in the first place. Fission reactors, like the one proposed for the car, require specific radioactive isotopes, such as uranium-235, which makes up just 0.7% of the world's uranium supply. To make it usable, uranium has to be enriched, a time-consuming and costly process. In the 1950s, it was assumed that there would be plenty of uranium to go around, given the massive stockpiles the US was accumulating for nuclear weapons. But in reality, there just isn't enough. If you think gas is expensive, imagine the price of replacing your reactor fuel. And then there's the issue of nuclear waste. Even today, disposing of spent nuclear fuel is a challenge we haven't solved efficiently. The thought of millions of cars producing nuclear waste only adds to that nightmare. What once seems like the futuristic dream of the Ford Nucleon now feels more like an anxiety-inducing disaster that's just waiting to happen. But in truth, none of these factors would have outright prevented the Ford Nucleon from being made or from functioning. It could have worked, but it would have been ridiculously heavy, wildly inefficient, fueled by scarce materials, dangerously unsafe, impossible to insure, and an absolute nightmare to drive. Remember the uh, battleship on wheels analogy. Combustion engines simply made far more sense. They were safer, they were cheaper to manufacture, and gasoline was far more abundant than uranium. This enabled mass production through economies of scale. In short, the reason we don't have nuclear cars isn't physics, it's capitalism. And to be fair, Ford's engineers and designers all likely saw it the same way. The challenges of making a nuclear car marketable, safe, and profitable were just too great. After 1958, the concept of the Ford Nucleon all but disappeared. The only physical evidence of its existence are the 3 8 scale models Ford created to showcase the car's futuristic design, along with a handful of period news articles. Today, a mock-up of the Nucleon is on display at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, the very place it was conceived decades ago. But a working prototype was never built. At the time, it simply couldn't be built, and so, rather fittingly, the Ford Nucleon ended up with a very short half-life. So, could humanity ever overcome the challenges of building a nuclear car? Maybe, but it's pretty unlikely. Even if we were to resolve the hurdles of weight, inefficiency, safety, and fuel supply, it probably wouldn't make sense for mass production. Meanwhile, electric vehicles or EVs are far better suited to industrial rollout and avoid many of the conversion issues inherent in nuclear power. An electric battery drives systems directly with only a single energy conversion, making it safer, simpler, and more efficient. Still, in some ways, the Ford Nucleon was ahead of its time. Its concept of swapping out reactors once they were spent mirrors modern charging stations for electric cars. Ford even envisioned the Nucleon with electronic systems in the front and rear to warn occupants of nearby road users, an idea that has become standard in today's driver-assist systems. In this sense, the Nucleon's legacy has lived on, not in the form of nuclear-powered cars, but in its forward-thinking vision of how technology could shape transportation. As for the next big leap in vehicle fuel solutions, hydrogen fuel cells appear to be the leading contender. In the long term, nuclear fusion, far more efficient than fission, might one day also become viable. Perhaps far into the future, we'll see a reimagined version of the nuclear on the roads, though hopefully uh, with a more practical design.